For the first time in a long, long while, daily life in America feels like it's getting back to normal. The pandemic is receding, masks are coming off, and people are returning to their favorite bars and coffee shops. But there is at least one major stumbling block. COVID mandates are loosening and more and more businesses are bringing employees back to the office, but not everyone is rushing back to their desks. Experts predict there will be a wave of resignations once people have to come back. That's right. Americans just don't want to go back to the office. According to a Gallup poll of remote workers, over 90% hope to continue doing some work from home after the pandemic. Three in 10 even said that they were extremely likely to look for a new job if their employers remove this option. The role of flexibility in work is a critical one right now as companies try to meet growing employee demands for work-life balance, but also try to think through issues of company culture, productivity, and inclusion. It's not just an issue of today, but a long-term one for society as we contemplate longer lives and longer careers. This is Century Lies from the Stanford Center on Longevity. I'm your host, Ken Stern. As we warm up for season two, we're going to continue to explore why the Great Resignation happened here in the United States, but not in so many other countries. In this episode, we're headed to Finland. Along with being the world's happiest country, Finland is known for prioritizing workplace trust, flexibility, and well-being. In many ways, it's a culture that has already begun to figure out some of the principles of the future of work. That problem of returning to the office? It wasn't really an issue here. I, I'm guessing here now, but my educated guess would be that Finns working life has not changed that drastically. They already had the flexibility before the pandemic. That's Herta Vorama. She's the director of research for the Future of Work program at Aalto University, located in the city of Espoo. Herta studies new technologies and people management. But before getting to that, we wanted to know, did Finland experience any sort of great resignation? Uh, well, I was actually, I went and checked with my colleagues at the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health, and they say that it doesn't really show in the stats of yet. You hear this, that there's more value-based questioning of what is it that we're doing here together, looking for purpose, looking for vision. But when you're looking at the sort of stats of Finnish working life, it doesn't really show. Compared to the roughly 4 million people resigning every month in the United States, this is pretty remarkable. Finland hasn't experienced the same job market shockwaves that the U.S. has. There is no employee exodus and no large-scale renegotiation of the terms of employment. I asked Herta, why is that? I've seen the global research on the Great Resignation, and there you see these people realize that I have four hours more in my day when I don't commute. So simple things like, you know, structure, like infrastructure has an impact on this. But then also, if you already had a trusting, flexible workplace, you might have already worked a lot from home. So the change is more like I'm missing my colleagues. I might guess would be that the Finnish everyday working life in the end, particularly with people who had a possibility to do a flexible distance work as much as they wanted to, wasn't that drastic. And in the U.S., you woke up like, wow, I've been giving my life away. Now I have all this time. And then you have time to think. And again, the same thing, you bring in the, the equation, the life, work, death. And it becomes a question of what am I using my life on? What am I, what am I doing with my time? In Finland, this approach to work is not just a cultural practice. It's actually the law, specifically the 1996 Working Hours Act. This act set guidelines for expected working hours, flexible work, and remote work. It was recently updated and expanded in 2020. So how did that law come into place? Well, when you're looking at the government explanations behind the first 1996 and then 2020, uh, this is, it's in a law, the Work Time Act. They say that it, it's basically because technology makes it possible. It's like you want to, as a sort of um, society, you know, take advantage of the technologies that are available there. Um, then it's also this notion that well-being at work has been here for much longer than it has been for in the U.S. in terms of research agenda. I know from colleagues who've been working in the U.S. that it's like relatively new to talk about well-being at work the same way as we do here. So I think it's like this, it, it has been this more of a holistic approach to work and life. And 
and it has to do with this social democratic welfare state background that we have. But yeah, there is this kind of like um, guidance of best practices and thinking of when you're looking at, for instance, the Institute of Occupational Health, there's a lot of research on, on the sort of effects on health in terms of working times and flexibilities. And so we're, we're, we're taking this kind of um, national health approach. In the United States, flexibility, at least of late, typically means locational flexibility, where you work. It means that in Finland too, but much more. Well, initially in 1996, uh, they were talking about option of adjusting their daily hours, uh, starting or finishing later or earlier. And this is actually interesting because I think this has been present much longer than that. I was 14 when I was able to decide whether I went to my summer job. I had a flex time between seven and nine to go and three and five to leave. And this was already then there. This was well before 1996. So it's been there already before the law. But the law came in 1996. And then that stated that they they put the flexibility in the work legislation. Then in 2020, they went further. And there they, they state that workers will be expected to put in an average of 40 hours a week. But this could include a multitude of different arrangements from regularly choosing fixed days Um, For instance, deciding that when you are working from another location, when you are at work, do you start, finish early? So basically, it's like gives you a fairly big freedom to structure your working days in collaboration with your employer. So in principle, the idea is that you could negotiate organization by organization that, okay, how do we do this? But because they've been dealing with remote work for longer, the Finns have also been dealing with the problems of remote work for longer. We had a round of interviews just before a pandemic. And uh, that then when we asked about the structures of work, what was changing in terms of the relationship between work and time, work and place, many of them brought up this, that the friction comes from work and place. And the, que- the problem is that the manager, your mindset, that there's no trust, that our middle managers don't trust our employees. So we have these flexible policies. We say everyone can do distance work. And then it stops at the middle management layer because they say that, no, if we let them go home, they're just going to go to the summer cottage or lay on the sofa, etc. So then the biggest friction point in our data pre-corona was still this, who gets to do distance work and how. The tradition of flexible work is primarily confined to white collar workplaces. This leaves out a large segment of the population. I asked Herta if there is a way of bringing that sort of flexibility to shift workers service workers, and other blue-collar jobs? Well, I guess this is, as far as I know, this is something that everyone's thinking about how to solve this. Lots of blue-collar workers have been at work all the time. They now feel fairly excluded from this discussion, national debate that's going on in Finland. It's like distance work this and distance work that. The issues look very different from the company perspective. If you're thinking about white collar workers, it's all about how to keep them engaged, how to keep them motivated on their sofas. Blue collar workers, you're talking about taking care of their basic health and safety, how to make sure that they don't get sick, how to make sure that they are, you know, holistically taken care of, how to include them is the right word. Inclusion is one of the biggest things. But as far as solutions of, of bringing flexi work to those kinds of positions, I am not aware of great examples at all. It makes intuitive sense that a happy employee is a productive employee. And we know that American companies love productive employees. And the U.S. typically ranks much higher than Finland in comparison of worker productivity. I asked Herta about the relationship between flexibility and productivity. Flexibility is one important element because it is, 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 is key for feeling of autonomy, which is key for your well-being at work. But it's very important to stress that it's just one factor, that when we're really looking at productivity, well-being turns into higher, higher productivity levels if it's holistically managed. So it's not like you bring them flexibility, uh, that's going to do the trick, they'll be more productive. But it's rather one of the elements that you would need to consider, Uh, ideally a very holistic approach to what all elements are relevant in our organization in terms of employee well-being and how well are we answering to them. So flexibility is, is, it's very important. 
I think that I don't, I'm not trying to downplay it, but the direct link to productivity with flexibility alone, I no, I was actually trying to locate some Finnish research for you because I, I knew that you would be interested in this. And the answer is that I can't find anything that would link just those things. It's more like you've got to take care of the, the holistic uh, whole and flexibility is one element that needs to be there. The Finnish philosophy of taking care of the whole is most often associated with the workplace flexibility her to describe, but it has other elements as well. I spoke with Tuma Sarnen, a co-founder of Futurize, a digital engineering and consultancy company that has been named Europe's best workplace in back-to-back -back years. Futurize has over 600 employees and is recognized for having a workplace culture with high degrees of transparency, trust, and flexibility. But there were growing pains along the way. Here's Tumas. So the first seven years, seven and a half years, everything went really smoothly. So people just like tried to do their best. We served our clients well. There was not that much kind of like official management or official any processes. But then 2008, that started to fail. Luckily, we knew that we will end up in this growth pain. So we like we kind of like already in 2008, seven, we bought all the books from Amazon, like how to scale the company. And all those books said during those days that that when you become a real company, you need to build real processes, you need to build hierarchies, you need to build approvals because the, the kind of small company approach just doesn't work. And we tried it for a couple of months. It didn't feel good. Uh, but then somebody asked the question that we have the, roughly the same people as we had one year ago. And now our assumption when we build the organization is that we build an organization so that, that we, we kind of think that people are stupid or irresponsible. One year ago, we, we, we run a company where we, where we believe that people are good and people are clever and people are responsible. Now everything changed. So then we sort of like went back and started thinking, is the problem on the people side? Are people stupid or irresponsible or has something else changed? And we, we came to the conclusion that people are still good, but the system had broken down. Because of the size, we lost transparency. So then we realized that let's try something different. Instead of building these hierarchies and approvals and uh, whatever, we decided let's start building transparency. Let's start sharing everything that we have, like, like starting from like Travis expense claims. Instead of uh, asking approval for those, everybody was able to, to send those in, but they were public for everybody. So everybody could see like my credit card bills. Everybody was able to see like other people's travel expense claims. So page forward another decade. So now you've been running the company and or you and your colleagues have been running the company in that philosophy for 10 years. What have you learned? Um, what is sort of the, how do you describe sort of the ethic of the company, the work ethic? Uh, what we learned is that actually it works. <laughs> we were able to grow from 80 people to 100 people to 200, 300, 400, 500, 600. Uh, and quite often people came and they kind of challenged that, okay, like this can't work like endlessly because you, at some point you need more and more. And kind of I understand, but I think the basic principles still apply. We, we trust people to make clever decisions or like sensible, re responsible decisions. But to do that, we need to give transparency. We need to also hold people accountable for those. So does, does your sort of sense of um, worker autonomy and, and individual decision making extend also to sort of where they work and the hours they work? Is that part of the culture of the company? So tell us a little bit about that, how that actually works in real life. It's actually quite interesting. We never ever made a decision about that we have a flexible working house. It was more like built in the day one so that, that people can work. I think what we started sort of emphasizing is that people need to carry the responsibility that, 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 that the team works so that, that wh however, wherever people work, the team needs to work. The company doesn't care where you work or when you work, but it needs to work for the clients, it needs to work for your team, it needs to work from the numbers point of view. So again, we're pushing the responsibility for people. What are the downsides of that type of work flexibility? Do you have trouble onboarding new employees? Is there, you know, are there advantages given to people who can be present? I mean, what are, what are the challenges? It doesn't work with every single individual. So I would say that that may be based on my experience, like every one out of 100 just can't stay on course. And I have maybe two times in my career as a CEO, I told somebody that now I, for a while, I remove your autonomy. Now your supervisor will tell you <laughs> what you work and when you work because it just didn't work. What we also learned is that for knowledge work performance, 
how people meet each other randomly is a big influence on how the organization works. And there's been really good studies, for example, at MIT and other universities that the social networks, who you meet, how you meet, how many often you meet, is a deciding factor of decision-making quality, innovation, project success. The networks define the organizational knowledge and how, which knowledge you have access to and how it works. And this is something that I think if we don't work in an office, we, it's really difficult to build such a networks because otherwise in the, in the sort of like online world, we tend to talk only to the people that, that we need to talk like because of the project or the team and so on. So, so what we are now trying to go towards is that when we go to office, we make sure that the office time is really well spent on connecting to other people. And then when we are like hybrid work or, or in online, setting we can focus on what what we are doing so so i think that we can overcome those challenges but we need to pay attention a lot how to do them because i think office was doing a lot of stuff that we didn't understand in the in the previous ways of working like facilitating knowledge and and building cohesion all those kind of things so i looked at your website and i saw a lot of pictures of teams together in non-office settings uh, at a lake or something. Is that just a nice pictures that you have on the website or is that actually a sort of intentional strategy you have? It's, it's intentional, yes. This is not something that somebody from the top down says that you need to have this, but we encourage. And then there are like cases that already many years ago, there was somebody from our Tampere office. They decided that why don't we actually go to Lapland and ski and work during the week? And then they even, because they thought that it's, it's our idea, I think the company sponsored only very little. I think not much, but, but the whole point was that let's go as sort of friends to the to Lapland. They were everybody from, from Futures and they, then they worked the hours there, but they also had a lot of fun together there. And then all sorts of these kind of cases. We also have this photo hiking, meaning that we encourage people to visit other offices. So they can go to another office and work for a week. Not to, not to do any project, not to do anything, but just go there and work for a week so that, that they can sort of meet other people and, and become family and so on. So I think this cohesion building, whether it's within the office hours or whether it's somewhere else or, or evening stuff, I think that's really crucial for the, for the culture as well. Do you think of this as sort of a, a reflection of the Finnish culture or is this something that you all developed independent of the broader, broader society? I think that, I think we are, within the society, we are rather, not, maybe not extreme, but, but sort of like not everybody works like this in, in, in Finland or Europe, but I think that, that maybe the kind of the Nordic way of like really equal and giving people quite a lot of like freedom and, and this kind of, I think that's the kind of the nature. And then we just sort of like taken it to the, the, the next level of like how it works. And, uh, and I think maybe the Nordic values are quite visible in, in how the company operates. It's not hard to see why Finland is the happiest nation on earth, according to the UN, and why it also has a productive and creative culture. We have the Finns to thank for the internet browser, heart monitors, saunas, and texting, and also them to blame for angry birds. Can the Finnish model of workplace flexibility and radical transparency also be a model for the US? Before the pandemic, I would have laughed at that notion, but two years of remote work and increased autonomy has clearly changed corporate calculus and the expectations of workers. And is this type of greater flexibility a key to helping careers not only be longer, but also happier and more productive? It is a critical question for us, and we'll get to that question soon, but not until I get back from skiing in Lapland. Century Lies is produced by Kerry Thompson, Aaron Slomsky pritz and Cameron Chertavian. Music for this episode was provided by Ramteen Arablui and the audio network. Century Lives is a production of the Stanford Center on Longevity, where our mission is to support ideas and research so that century-long lives are healthy and rewarding ones. You can find out more about us at longevity.stanford.edu. Support for the Stanford Center on Longevity comes from the Annenberg Foundation, dedicated to addressing the critical issues of our time through innovation, community, compassion, and communication. Thanks for listening. I'm Ken Stern.